Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Good morning to the rest of those listening throughout the country. Uh, on behalf of Womble Pride, which is Womble Bond Dickinson's newly launched affinity group for LGBTQ lawyers, staff, and allies. And on behalf of the National LGBT Bar Association's Lavender Link series, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion. I'd like to thank Darcy Kimnitz, Executive Director of the Bar, and Nick Tiger, the Volunteer Coordinator for the Lavender Link series, for hosting and coordinating today's event. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to my colleagues, Carrie Bennett and Ashley Laney, who helped to coordinate the discussion today. Um, my name is David Carter. I am a partner in the litigation and telecommunications practices, practices at Womble Bond Dickinson. Just one quick housekeeping matter as we get started. If you have any questions during today's discussion, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom and we'll do our best to try to get to those as we have time. I'm very much looking forward to an insightful discussion today with our guest, Gigi Sohn. But first, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome former FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn for our introduction. Commissioner Clyburn broke barriers when she became the first woman to head the Federal Communications Commission in May 2013, when she was appointed as acting chair by President Barack Obama. This was during her tenure, uh, second term as a commissioner on the FCC, and she began her service there in August of 2009. After she spent more than 11 years as a member of the Public Service Commission of South Carolina, including two years as its chair. Prior to her service on the Public Service Commission, Commissioner Clyburn was the publisher and general manager of the Coastal Times, a South Carolina newspaper that she co-owned and operated for more than 14 years. Commissioner Clyburn is someone who has consistently been a strong advocate for equity and inclusion. She has advocated for improved accessibility and communications for disabled citizens. She has long committed to herself to narrowing the digital divide that hampers economic opportunity for rural, Native American, African American, Latino, and low income communities. She championed diversity in media ownership and in STEM education. And she has been a tireless advocate for net neutrality. Speaking at the Lesbians Who Tech conference in San Francisco in May, 2018, Commissioner Clyburn spoke passionately about the power that an open and free internet played in raising awareness of social justice issues that otherwise would have gone overlooked by the media. Citing as examples, Ferguson, Missouri, Black Lives Matters, and the Me Too movements. Commissioner Clyburn called at that, in, the, in her speech at that conference, the FCC's 2017 decision to roll back net neutrality, a move that was quote, meant to depress and strip away the freedoms of the most enabling and most equalizing platform of our time. Commissioner Clyburn is now a founder and principal at MLC Strategies, where she provides strategic advice and critical solutions for businesses in the technology, media, and telecommunications industries. And it is very much my pleasure to welcome you uh, here this morning, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you so much, David, for that very generous introduction. And I will share that with my family because uh, I don't think they believe a word of it. So I appreciate that. For those new to tech and telecom, Gigi Sohn is one of the most influential people outside of government in Washington, DC according to uh, what I just read, but to others who've been watching before this year's list was released, Gigi has been at the epicenter of communications and technology policy debates for decades. I got introduced to Gigi before we met on the eve of my appointment to the FCC in 2009. I'm gonna embarrass her a little bit. To say it was not a friendship at first sight is an understatement. 
but the foundation would soon be laid for a very solid, incredibly meaningful friendship. Within a year after opposing my nomination, you know you did, Gigi. <laughs> she walked into my office and in her classic cut to the chase style, shared in just a few minutes words that would forever alter the way I would conduct myself in the regulatory and technology arena. She said these words to me, I read you wrong. I respect what you're doing. That's all I came here to say. And she left the office. Until that day, Amia Coppola was not that wasn't a part of my lexicon. I didn't go around um, in my neighborhood saying, you know, Mia Copa. <laughs> I didn't, I did not. I knew what it meant. But on that day, not only did I learn about a lot about Gigi Son and what that meant coming from her, but I learned a lot about myself. That was a powerful moment for me. And it shifted my approach to public service. Now, I share this story not to stir the pot or to uh, get Gigi to practice uh, some of uh, her uh, Cobb McGraw name. <laughs> I share that to punctuate the very essence from where I sit of Gigi Song, a fierce advocate, an unwavering defender of competition in media and telecom, an untiring proponent for innovation and accessibility in tech, affordable high-speed broadband and user privacy. But that's just one side of the, of the GG coin. Regardless of job title, group, group association, or, or any award bestowed, every single sentence defining or describing GG song ends in four words, in the public interest. I grew by watching, listening, interacting, and yes, debating GG, because to know GG is to debate GG. But what still impresses me the most is the other side of the GG coin. There are no exceptions, no exemptions, no exclusions when it comes to her standards. She views me, you, and even herself through the very same lens. No matter what, Gigi will defend or oppose anyone or any entity that fails to act in the public interest. The distinguished fellow at Georgetown Law Institute for Technology Law and Policy, Benton's senior fellow, the co-founder of Public Knowledge, the former executive director of the Media Access Project, and most recently, as you know, uh, we shared this distinction, and I thank her for this, an Open Society Foundation's Leadership in Government Fellow, and yes, a Mozilla Fellow. She was not only the conscious of FCC Chairman Wheeler's office, but it is a counselor for so many of us who wish we knew one one hundredth of what she has retained. And if you think this fierceness is limited to tech and telecom, try getting in between her wife, Laura, or daughter, Yossi, that goalpost on a rugby field or the public interest. I would not even entertain posing a threat to her um, so she could put those Carl McGraw techniques at use, but seriously. You could not have chosen a better presenter for this Lavender Lynx program series. You will learn, get challenged, and be inspired by Gigi Song. It is my pleasure to introduce to some the most incredible, incomparable, and yes, I'll say, I, I'll leave that last one to myself. <laughs> The most phenomenal person I know, Gigi Song. Wow. I don't know where to begin uh, other than to say, Mignon, you are, I'm not sure I oppose your nomination. Let's say I was skeptical, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I was <laughs> so wrong uh, as not to be believed. And yeah, I owned up to it and I owned up to it quickly because you, you, proved, you proved us in the, the public interest community wrong 
very, very quickly. So um, I, I feel like I could drop the mic already, uh, but I wanted to thank you uh, for those fantastic comments. I also want to thank, before we start with the, with the presentation, the LGBT bar, Womble Pride, David Carter, Carrie Bennett, Darcy Chemnitz, uh, who I've known for a gazillion years. You know, I, I cut my teeth as the president of what was called then Gay Law in Washington, D.C., uh, and now it's called the LGBT Bar of Washington, I believe. Um, I was also the first openly gay person, openly gay or lesbian person uh, elected to the Board of Governors of the DC Bar. So I have a long history with Darcy, uh, but Mignon, those words just mean so much to me. And uh, I will never practice Krav Maga or rugby on you uh, because you are my friend. <laughs> Uh, so th thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, for joining us today for those introductions, such kind words and, and really insightful uh, story there about the, the power of Gigi Sohn uh, in, in all things that she does. So let us dive into some policy discussions about the future of communications policy under the Biden administration. And, you know, Gigi, we took this title um, for this presentation, Big, Bold, and Bipartisan, from an article that you had written. And we added a question mark at the end of it, because I think the question that will be on a lot of people's minds as they're listening today is, is there a bipartisan path forward on some of these important issues of public policy? So let us dive into net neutrality, which is an issue that you've really had a front row seat to. Uh, since your time well before your service as uh, part of Chairman Wheeler's staff. And, you know, probably even before my understanding or following of this issue, which really picks up when you were the president of the consumer group, Public Knowledge. And I recall as a young attorney, you, uh, Public Knowledge, and under your leadership, advocating the F for the FCC to really begin investigating issues related to net neutrality. You filed petitions putting a spotlight on Comcast bit torrent blocking, which became a, a, a pretty hot button topic. You also focused on decisions by Verizon to block text messages sent by NARAL because they were uh, deemed to be perhaps too politically sensitive at the time. But for those that are maybe uh, haven't followed this issue closely, let me just provide a quick sketch of, of kind of the history here. So net neutrality became, I think, increasingly important and in the public spotlight during the 2008 elections when then Senator Obama uh, expressed his support for having net neutrality policies. And in the years since then, this issue, I like to say, is sort of ping ponged between the FCC and the courts. Uh, not at all uncommon uh, on communications policy issues, but perhaps somewhat uncommon on an issue that impacts so many people across the country. And so during his first term um, uh, under President Obama, then Chairman Janikowski attempted what might be referred to as a light touch approach to net neutrality. He didn't declare the internet to be a telecommunications service. He did not uh, find that internet service providers were common carriers, which brings with it a lot of uh, additional regulation and burdens. But he attempted more of a lighter touch approach which was challenged and ultimately struck down in the courts in 2014. In 2015, the FCC tried again. This time it went with that uh, designation of a communication service, common carrier regulation, but also at the same time did forbearance to, to not put the heaviest burden on the internet service providers. And this approach, the court actually upheld and said it was a lawful means of implementing net neutrality. However, under the Trump administration and Chairman Pai at the time, the FCC voted to reverse that course of action, roll back those net neutrality rules, and at the same time also made clear that they would uh, fight to prevent states from picking up this issue like California and implementing their own net neutrality rules. Earlier this month now under the Biden administration, we have yet another change where the Biden uh, Justice Department has withdrawn its objections to the California net neutrality rules, clearing the way at this point for state level enforcement of, of policies. 
and perhaps what could be um, the, for those dealing with regulations, the most challenging, which is to have a 50 state approach where you have different obligations all across the country. So recognizing that this is just a rough sketch, there's a lot of detail for those like you that follow this issue much more closely. Let's just start with this question, how did net neutrality of all things become such a political and politicized issue? Thanks, David. Uh, and yeah, boy, the history of net neutrality is 20 years long, almost 20 years long now. So, uh, but that was a very good sketch. Look, I think it's really important for folks to understand that net neutrality is only a partisan issue in Washington, D.C., and it's only a highly charged political issue in Washington, D.C. Polls done by Republican pollsters, Democratic pollsters show that 80 percent of people, again, across the board, it doesn't matter what the, your, your party affiliation or ideology is, support net neutrality and, in fact, support reinstatement of the 2015 Open Internet Order, which not only adopted net neutrality rules, but as you mentioned, and I'm gonna say this so many times, I think I'm gonna bore people, uh, reinstated the FCC's authority to oversee the broadband market, right? So by reclassifying uh, broadband internet access as a telecommunications service under Title II of the Communications Act, the FCC you know, reinstated its ability to protect consumers, promote competition in the broadband market, and that's why it's political, okay? It's political because it's become this sort of big government issue. Well, we don't, we don't need the government. We don't need the FCC messing with the internet, regulating the internet, even though they're not regulating the internet, they're regulating the on-ramps to the internet, which have been regulated, you know, were regulated from, from their very inception. Uh, you know, uh, broadband internet access, even when it was dial-up, was a telecommunication service, and it wasn't until 2002, uh, 2005 actually, because it went, oh, went all the way to Supreme Court, that that changed. So uh, that's why it's become so political. You know, Republicans don't think that the FCC should have oversight over the broadband market, and Democrats do. So, uh, you know, that's basically, you know, look, most people think it makes sense that you and I, and not the broadband provider, should control their internet experience. Right. But because it's gotten caught up in this authority issue, it's not caught up, it's core. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's so politicized. So when we had the rollback of the, of the open internet order and the reclassification under, the, under Chairman Pai, you know, part of the rhetoric that we heard at that time was an insistence that th this was really a solution in search of a problem, right? And that, you know, if we, as long as we have some transparency, that the market forces will ensure that everyone gets, still gets free and fair access to the internet and that there's really nothing for the government to do here. So I, I'm sure that you have a different perspective to offer on that point. Uh, so let me just ask you, you know, what do you say to people when they say, you know, you're, you're, there's no need for all this regulation because everything is just fine the way it is? Yeah, I, I say two things. The first thing I say is, what market forces are we talking about? So the Institute for Local Self-Reliance did a study that showed that 50 million Americans get their broadband from one of two cable companies, and another 33 million get their competitive choice, see the air quotes, uh, from digital subscriber line, which oftentimes doesn't even hit the, the very slow speed benchmark for broadband. So, you know, what market forces are there if there's no competition? Even under the FCC's data, which grossly overstates who has broadband, 72% of Americans have zero or one choice of fixed broadband provider with speeds of 100 megabits per second down and 10 megabits per second up. I mean, that, that's, not, that's not a market, that's a monopoly. So that's number one. But number two, again, I'm gonna tire people uh, by saying this, the debate over net neutrality really isn't about blocking or throttling or even paid prioritization, okay? It's really about whether the FCC should have authority to protect consumers and promote competition in the broadband market. And the, and the, the Pi decision to completely wash its hands of that responsibility, abdicate that responsibility, has, has resulted in demonstrable harm, right? So in California, to the extent there's a bunch of folks on the West Coast on the call, 
in California uh, when fire departments were fighting the Mendocino complex fire. These are firefighters from Santa Clara. Uh, Verizon was throttling their broadband service because they wanted them to pay more. Now, was that a pure net neutrality violation? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. There was nowhere that, that the firefighters can go to get any recourse, right? Similarly, when uh, it was found that uh, three of the four at the time, major mobile broadband providers were, were selling uh, personal data to data brokers who were then selling it to bounty hunters, uh, the FCC, didn't do anything for months and months and months. So that ability to protect consumers, promote competition and close the digital divide, because this is really critical because the provisions that support subsidies for poor people, that support subsidies for um, people to build out, companies to build out broadband are tied to telecommunication services. So if broadband is not a telecommunication services, service, how does the FCC have the ability to give money for those two? Now they have, because they've been operating under a very, I would say very um, weak uh, legal argument. But if somebody really wanted to challenge the FCC's ability to provide those subsidies, I think they would win in court. So it sounds like you think mark, the market, A, there's a lot of consolidation. So the market forces are not as strong as you might, uh, one might presume them or want them to be. But secondarily, you feel like there needs to be some teeth behind it. So when the market forces are inadequate, that there is at least the vehicle through which additional uh, oversight could be, could be brought to bear. Yeah. And, and look, you said it yourself, you know, this notion that you know, this is what we did in 2015 was heavy handed regulation was a bunch of nonsense because we forbore from the vast majority of the provisions of Title II, right? The Communications Act gives you the permission, those that are not steeped in communications law, I'll just explain it. The FCC can decide not to apply parts of the Communications Act if it finds it's not in the public interest. And we went provision by provision provi by provision by provision and said, okay, what is the lightest touch we can give to broadband yet still maintain important oversight for privacy, okay? For discriminatory practices, for fraudulent billing, so we kept really the barest bones of Title II that would protect consumers and promote competition. True. So as you know, and many of the people on the call obviously are lawyers listening and are somewhat familiar with the Supreme Court's decision in Brand X, which um, has, I think, a lot of interesting implications for modern day policy and particularly in the regulatory environment. And you know, to sum up for index at a very high level, it stands for the proposition that an agency which has implemented rules with discretion retains the discretion to change their mind, to change their policy, as long as they can provide a reasonable explanation. So if you sort of think about the, there's a, a, a zone of reasonableness and the agency can move within that zone at any point in time, it helps to explain a little bit why we have this ping pong effect, right? And I think it creates a lot of important implications, particularly in the telecommunications sphere, where the policy is changing, the technology is evolving. But how do we get to a point in which businesses and the American people have some level of finality and certainty? You know, what I hear so often from my clients on a number of different issues is, I don't really care that much about what the policy is. I just want there to be a policy so I can run my business and operate it legally, right? But when, it, when you have this kind of ping-ponging and changing all the time, it, it makes it very difficult, I think, for businesses to, to um, really build their future and see where they can innovate and change and offer new services. So any thoughts about that? Lots of thoughts. So first of all, I just want to say that the Chevron Doctrine, which is what Brand X was based upon, okay, so the, the Chevron Doctrine says unless the organic statute is very, and the legislative history are crystal clear, an agency has discretion to, you know, to interpret it. And I want to say first, that doctrine is very much at risk. Uh, Justice Thomas, in a dissent not that long ago, said he believed that he, you know, that Brand X was wrongly decided because a, a court in Portland, Oregon had, had, had made a decision that was contrary to what they decided. 
So I worry uh, about Chevron, although I have to say in my career, I've lived by Chevron and I've died by Chevron. So mm -hmm. it can be, it's a double-edged sword. But look, Congress needs to solve this, this issue of, of, of FCC authority. Otherwise you are gonna have the ping pong game, right? I mean, the ping pong game is, is, is a, an industry term that I've now adopted because it's exactly what's happening. So, you know, Congress needs to give the FCC unquestionable, undeniable authority over broadband. And it also needs to give it express authority to adopt net neutrality rules. Because I fear, um, particularly Justice Kavanaugh is of the mind that when you have a, a policy that is so important to the economy, Congress must give express uh, authority for the agency to adopt that policy. And, you know, I think he's becoming increasingly influential in the Supreme Court. So it, it's, it can't just be, okay, FCC, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have Title 10 or Title 7 or whatever you wanna call it, we'll get away from Title 2 and we'll give you a th hopefully, you know, a broad and strong authority over broadband. But they also need to say, yes, and, and the agency you know, shall adopt rules to, you know, to regulate the, 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 the broadband management, the network management practices of broadband, broadband internet access providers. I think that's really, really important. But if they don't, I'm all for the states continuing to pass their own laws, own net neutrality laws, and in addition, take back their authority over broadband, which by the way, many states gave away in the early part of the century. They were told, well, the feds have it, so you don't need to oversee broadband, you know, go do something else. And now, particularly given what's happened during the pandemic, a lot of states are looking and saying, oh my God, I, I have no power over these companies whatsoever uh, and I need to take it back. So, um, you know, the, the states I think should continue to act regardless, but I really, really, really want to see Congress solve this problem once and for all. And do you, do you think there is a, a bipartisan pathway here for Congress to act or do you feel like um, it's going to take uh, you know, more states to start moving and then eventually Congress to realize that the patchwork is such a problem that maybe, you know, what do you think is going to come first? F well, I, I think that is going to happen. I think, I think number one, when we have a full FCC, which we do not have now, they will reclassify and they'll either, they'll either reinstate the 2015 rules or possibly strengthen them. I don't know yet because we don't have that majority yet. And I think, I know Massachusetts, New York, there's a whole bunch of states, Connecticut just had a hearing the other day, uh, wanna pass net neutrality bill. So I do think that that's gonna force pressure on all the parties, you know, on the, on the ISPs and their friends in Congress to come to the table. Look, there's one just key point I wanna make about this. There's no net neutrality compromise that doesn't include authority. And, and look, I, I talk to the industry all the time. And I remember, you know, not long after I left the FCC, a bunch of folks in some of the companies said, Gigi, let's get together and talk about net neutrality. And I, and I said to them, and we had a very nice lunch, and I said to them point blank, we can debate the scope of authority, what it should be, should it include privacy, should it include, you know, certain other things. But if we're, if we're starting from a baseline of the FCC shall have no oversight of the broadband market, there's nothing to talk about. So I, I say to my friends in industry, let's have a debate over the scope of the authority and maybe we can get somewhere. Okay. So we have a question from the audience that I uh, will throw in to you now. And this question is, do you think that there will be any appetite from a Biden FCC to have any sort of regulation around streaming services that are the, the services actually riding on top of the internet? Yeah, I mean, I, the problem for, you know, for the FCC regulating content, right, is that there's a jurisdictional issue, right? And this is something when we get to the Section 230 conversation, which I expect we will, you know, is problematic. The FCC's subject matter jurisdiction is communication by wire or radio. And I suppose you could argue it both ways, but I, I'm skeptical that the FCC has jurisdiction to regulate streaming services just because they're streaming services. Now, the FCC has in the past regulated content because they had other jurisdiction, for example, over, you know, over broadcast licensees, right? But if it's just a, a streaming service, let's say Netflix, 
I don't see where the FCC has the authority. Now, of course, Congress can give them that authority. Same thing with Section 230. Uh, but, you know, I haven't heard any talk about that, uh, about that being desirable, but it's a conversation that I expect will be had uh, in the halls of the FCC. Okay. So uh, I mentioned earlier, as we were setting up the net neutrality the discussion, the petition that you filed regarding Verizon and the blocking of text messages with NARAL. And, you know, I watched uh, as we were preparing for this discussion, a January 2008 interview that you gave with C-SPAN, where you talked about that issue. Uh, you placed it in this context of net neutrality. And, you know, honestly, when I watched that, I wasn't sure whether to, to laugh or cry, uh, probably more towards the cry side, I would say, uh, because the same issue that you discussed now 12 or 13 years ago is still playing out today, right? And uh, I work with a lot of text messaging platform providers and others. And, you know, in the last month alone, I've had issues where carriers, a carrier has wanted to turn off political campaigns from both sides of the spectrum, right? Uh, both conservative and liberal campaigns. I've also had issues where they don't want uh, marijuana cannabis dispensaries who serve you know, the public under state law, fully in compliance with state law to be able to transmit messages to their own customers across the network. And so, you know, when you think about net neutrality and you think about text messages, that there's a, to me, there's an important thing that, that doesn't get brought up all the, all the time, which is there's no spam box to go and check whether your carrier has been blocking text messages that it decided you didn't want to receive. You can't tell them to, to unblock something that they're blocking. And despite this fact that the blocking happens without the consumer even being aware of it, the FCC a few years ago in 2018 declared that text messages were gonna be an information service. They weren't gonna be subject to common carrier regulation. And then indeed they expressly authorized and encouraged carriers to engage in blocking activity when they believed that the messages were unwanted messages that the consumer hadn't signed up for them. So my question is, do you think that the Biden administration under the FCC should revisit this decision to really place the power of blocking in the hands of carriers? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, as you alluded to in 2007, God, 14 years ago, when I was at Public Knowledge, we filed a petition asking the FCC to classify SMS text messages as Title II services. Uh, and that petition sat and sat and sat and sat and sat. And I think actually uh, after I left, they revived it again in 2018 uh, and, and again gave, unfortunately, the PI at FCC the opportunity to declare it a Title I service. Look, for some people, and I think I, I probably classify myself as one of those people, text messaging, that's the main way I communicate. And it's certainly the main way that a lot of political candidates a lot of issue-oriented organizations and businesses communicate, right? So to place the power of blocking those messages or not giving organizations short codes, which is that was the, that was the actual NARAL thing, right? They wanted a, 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 a special five-digit code, that five or seven-digit code that would that would then they would then use to to NARAL would then use to communicate to their members. Uh, they sh that power shouldn't be in their hands, right? They should be common carriers. Now, you know, you're getting into the issue of, you know, robocalling and robocalls. And look, nobody likes robocalls. They're like the scourge of, of, of everybody. But I think the answer to unwanted text messages and unwanted calls is not to have the carrier determine what's unwanted, but to, for the consumer to determine what's unwanted and the carrier should give consumers for free the technology necessary to block unwanted messages and unwanted calls. So look, the great thing about the technology and the technological revolution we're living through now is that it empowers people to control their experience either over their phone or over the internet. So we need to give them tools. The other thing I'd like to see the carriers do and they're mandated to do it by June of, of this year is implement the stir shaken protocol, which would block spoofed calls. Uh, I always talk about the call I got when my dad was uh, ill. Uh, I got a call from the Washington Hospital Center. 
but it wasn't from the Washington Hospital Center. And of course my heart sank. I mean, it's just like, that is just, that's evil. That's all I can say. So that, you know, I think the carriers have a duty to adopt that. Um, and they also have a duty to give their customers who pay handsomely for their services, by the way, the technology to put the power in their hands. And so we also saw something that, that frankly was surprising to me, um, sort of knowing at the core of common carrier service has always been this notion that you deliver the content, you don't interrupt, you don't in inject yourself in the call flows, right? But yet we saw changes that actually have empowered carriers also to start blocking voice traffic in a way that's never, never existed previously. And, and in fact, was very antithetical to a lot of the prior orders the commission had, had issued on this. And it, again, it goes to the question of how do you balance this demand for, from consumers to not be inundated with unwanted calls and robocalls, calls, yet you're putting a lot of power in the hands of, you know, really at this point, three large companies that have the vast majority of the market share. So I guess a question I have that kind of relates a little bit to NARAL, um, but should LGBTQ organizations in particular be concerned about the potential that the content they want to send to their constituents, their allies, things of, of that nature, that it could be found to be offensive, it could be unilaterally blocked um, by private businesses and that they wouldn't have recourse to, to challenge those decisions. Yeah, I, the recourse point is a really important point, David. And again, at, at, at the risk of beating a dead horse over and over again, that's what Title II gives to consumers, that's what it gives to businesses, it, 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 what it gives to the public, and I think it's critically important. And particularly for the LGBTQ community, marginalized communities, their voices are always the first one to be at risk. Okay, and, and this is, you know, this is true whether you're speaking over the phone or posting a website or on social media. So, you know, be careful sometimes what you ask for, you might get it, and you'll, you guys will be the first ones to be blocked. I mean, I, I think about, you know, how many stories we've heard about child-friendly software on computers in schools and libraries that block the words gay or lesbian or transgender, you know, just because they're, you know, they're overbroad and they want to make sure that, you know, nobody is offended. So, you know, without a requirement that ISPs and mobile carriers be common carriers that is required to carry all traffic without discrimination, Private businesses are gonna to seek to avoid controversy, either because of political pressure or their clients or advertisers. So look, I'm, I'm all for the common carriage model when it comes to you know, voice and internet communications. Great. So we've touched a little bit, obviously on robocalls, but I wanna, you know, we have a lot of in-house counsel here that probably deal with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And I want to focus in for those uh, not familiar with the act that governs the use of sort of robocall technology there, and that in, often includes text messages. And there's a host of questions that we could talk about this. There's Supreme Court cases pending, but I want to just focus in on one aspect of this, which is that the TCPA is, as far as I'm aware, the only statute that we have that imposes statutory penalties of, you know, $500 per message, per call, if you're found to have violated the act. And there's no cor corresponding cap on class action damages, right? And so we have federal anti-discrimination laws that have class action caps on them, but yet for whatever reason, the TCPA, you could have unlimited damages. And we've seen cases where the, the, uh, the damages that are sought have gotten to the billions, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, you know, cases that would clearly cripple even some of our largest companies in the country. And I kind of refer to this as, you know, it's kind of like the Hunger Games right now, right? You have people scrapping to find cases. They're, they're looking for ways to um, ramp up the damages, put pressure, get to a point where the risk is so uh, enormous that even if you don't actually believe you did anything wrong, that you could defend yourself, that the risk is, is just too great. And so you enter into settlements, which kind of feeds the process in and of itself, right? So my question really is, do you see, is there any role the FCC could play 
in creating balance and avoiding some of the, the, the rise of litigation that we've seen over the past few years in this particular arena? Or is this an area where you feel like only Congress really has uh, the keys to the kingdom, so to speak? Yeah, look, obviously the FCC has some authority to interpret the law. And I will tell you, I, I still have PTSD uh, because the law really, I think, put the FCC in a lot of ways in a bad position of trying to decide. So the FCC is allowed to grant exemptions to the law. You know, so you're about, you know, what's, you know, who's the more worthy business or who's the more worthy nonprofit? I mean, or who's the more worthy, you know, set of individuals? I think it just puts the, the agency in a, in a bad position. Also, look, you know, you referred to this Facebook case that the, that the Supreme Court is looking at, and, and there was agreement among both liberal and conservative justices that the statute needs refreshing. <laughs> it's right. 30 years old and the technology has passed it by. Look, the, you know, the meaning of the law and the purpose of the law, I think is still, you know, very solid, you know, to limit these annoying robocalls and to, to protect people's privacy. But, you know, when you're trying to determine what an automatic telephone dialing system is, <laughs> when people are sending text messages and, and sending, you know, messages, of, it, it's like, it's, it needs updating desperately. Uh, and I wonder, it'd be interesting to see how far the Supreme Court goes. Some commentators say they may strike down the law entirely, which I think would be terrible, uh, but it also might give Congress a, a bit of a kick in the behind. But to answer your question, I can't imagine an issue that the FCC is less qualified to fix <laughs> than the abuse of the private right of action. I mean, I've heard these stories and I'm, I'm, some, I'm somewhat sympathetic, um, but this is an issue that Congress has to fix. I mean, what does the FCC know about, you know, litigation practice and, and abuses of private right of action? That's not really where its expertise is. I suppose it could take its hand in it. I wouldn't advise it to. So this is, again, Congress needs to update this law uh, it needs to have hearings about, you know, some of the practices around around this law, uh, and fix those abuses. Because I, I do agree with you, it is it is problematic. Uh, people have just taken advantage, and I'm generally in favor of private rights of action. But I've heard so many horror stories that there just needs to be, you know, some maybe some kind of sanctions for people that abuse it. Uh, it needs to have some disincentive for those kind of abuses. Right. Okay. So. Um... Let's shift gears and talk a little bit about an area that has been in the news quite a bit, uh, certainly towards the end of last year, and that's uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, it has become a topic of debate among both parties. And, and for those that are listening, you may recall, as President Trump's tenure was winding down, he vetoed a $740 billion National Defense Authorization Act specifically because he wanted to invalidate or repeal Section 230. And, and Section 230 provides something of a shield for internet companies from lawsuits or for content posted on their site. It seems to me, as like watching the news right now, that both parties agree that Section 230 needs to be reformed, but for very different reasons, sort of coming at it from two different perspectives as we often see. Um, so there's been arguments that Section 230 in, allows and encourages social media companies to engage in censorship of conservative viewpoints. And at the same time, President Biden, uh, when he was running for office said that social media companies need to be held accountable when they disseminate false information, right? So the concern being that uh, not that you're censoring conservative viewpoints, but that you're actually out there promoting information that you know to be false. And, and President Biden then, uh, when he was running, called for Section 230 to, see, to be just straight up revoked, taken away uh, the protections that it offered. So do you have a perspective? Does Section 230 need to be reformed? And where is that need you know, where should the policy go from this point? Yeah, so I'm open to modernizing Section 230. Uh, I do think that some of the process reforms that have been floated, requirements to remove content determined by a court to be illegal, uh, requirements of transparency about content moderations, due process, I think they make a lot of sense. But I think it's really also important 
to recognize that the burdens of Section 230 will fall differently on different social media platforms depending on their size. So the rules for Facebook, Google, Amazon should not be the same as for Wikimedia and, and Reddit and other, and frankly, you know, Gigi Stone's block, right? Because Section 230 actually does go to the liability I might have if I had a blog and I allowed comments, Section 230 would apply to me. And I think people don't realize that. They, they tend to think that the internet is four or five companies and it's not. It's millions of websites, it's millions of blogs, uh, and it's millions of individuals. Again, some of these models like Wikipedia, the content is moderated by the individual users. So their individual users are on the hook. So you know, when we're trying to legislate in this area, we have to be really, really careful about how we craft it so we don't you know, you know, kill the innovators or the small companies. Because look, Facebook and Google, they've got the money to handle these lawsuits, right? And to, or to handle these kind of process reforms. But, you know, the smaller person, the smaller company is not going to be able to do that. Let me make one other point. I think it's really, really important. The debate over Section 230, I find, is often a proxy for other concerns, right? That the largest tech platforms are too big, they're too powerful, and they use that bigness and power to staunch competition to harm consumers, right? That they control too much personal information, which they sell and they use to become even more powerful. So if we're talking about Section 230 reform, that's one, part, that's one leg of the platform accountability stool. We also have to talk about a national consumer privacy and data security law. We also have to talk about strengthening antitrust law and strengthening competition policy. If you just focus on Section 230 and those other two things, I don't think you're getting at what people are really worried about. And I watch every single hearing about Section 230, about the power of the, of the big tech companies. And on a bipartisan basis, they're worried about the power. So how do you deal with the power? Not just by Section 230. And frankly, I think that's less of the issue than the other two I mentioned. So I think in that regard, we, you know, we talked about blocking, whether it's blocking phone calls, whether it's blocking text messages, whether it's blocking uh, viewpoints on a website. And they all seem to really at the heart of it, we've come down to the question of who should decide, right? Who should decide what content ultimately reaches the American public? So are you advocating when in, your, in the, the comments that you just made, are you advocating for something of a, of a uniform policy to all of those issues about blocking? Like is, is, there, is there a common thread that you could tie together those issues or do you, you know, what does the policy look like that gets us to the right outcome? Yeah, look, I think you have to think long and hard about this. I think there are good reasons to treat the pipes differently than the content that rides on those pipes. I mean, do we really, really want online platforms to be required to carry all content without discrimination? I mean, that would mean, I mean, if you're worried about misinformation, hate speech and harassing speech and speech that promotes violence on these platforms, that's what you that would be the license if you treated them as a common carrier you're giving them license to do that i i don't think that's particularly good policy you know you know oftentimes in the broadband industry floats this idea of regulatory parity but they're not the same industries and they have different purposes and they have different market structures so i don't have a problem with treating them differently okay. now that doesn't that's to say and I'm, I'm sucking up to some people who I, I see in the, in the participant uh, uh, row there, but I do believe this. This is not to say that I think the platform should be unregulated. I'm very much in favor of my former boss uh, and former colleague Harold Feld's idea of having a regulatory agency that oversees platforms, online platforms. These companies are pretty much unregulated and they're just too important to the economy, too important to the public debate, too important to democracy to just leave them unregulated. And that idea would be to have an agency outside of the FCC. It wouldn't Correct. be part of the FCC. It would Correct. Be Again, Congress could give the FCC authority. It makes me uncomfortable. Look, it makes me uncomfortable. Maybe it doesn't make any sense that it does, but it does. I just think that the FCC has a role to oversee the on-ramps to communications networks and to make sure everybody has them. And and no matter what you think of Facebook and Google and, and Amazon, we still need to get online. If we haven't learned that <laughs> over the last year, I don't know why we'll I ever learn it, right? right. So that needs to happen. 
that's the FCC's expertise. I think there's room and uh, for a new agency that really has expertise in how the online platforms operate. So I'd like to see a separate agency, knowing that you know, forming new agencies is always a tough haul. But I do think you know if we continue down the road we've been we've been the last couple of years with these with these uh, companies, there's going to be more and more of a call for a regulatory agency like that. Yeah. So I think that's a great segue, Gigi, to when you said, if we haven't learned about the importance of getting online in the last year, when will we? So let's talk a little bit about the, the closing the digital divide. And, um, you know, this has actually been a largely bipartisan goal, I think. Uh, so an area where we see uh, common ground, perhaps. Thankfully, and um, you know, it impacts inner city as well as rural areas. There's affordability issues uh, baked into that discussion. But considering the amount of state and federal funding that has already been made available and is being made available, even under the most current, uh, the new stimulus plan, you know, what is it that is still needed? And how do we ensure when you have multiple agencies within the federal government and then state government handing out money, how do we ensure that we really have a clear sense of where the gaps still exist and make sure that we're not just gold plating networks or overbuilding networks that already exist today? Well, you start at square one and that is with good data, good data and good maps. So, you know, right now, the data that the FCC is using to determine where there is broadband and where there is not is grossly inaccurate because it measures, you know, who in a census block not necessarily has broadband, but could get broadband. So it's, 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 it's doubly bad and you can't make good funding decisions or a good policy with bad maps. So, you know, thankfully Congress did pass the Broadband Data Act uh, and the FCC is moving maybe a little bit more slowly than I'd prefer to, to build these maps. Uh, and Congress has given the FCC $98 million, which is critically important. But, I, I, you know, I was very distressed that the FCC gave out $9 billion under the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund based on old maps just because they wanted to push the money out the door, I think, in a very political decision. Mm -hmm. So... Good maps, and by the way, those maps should be used across the government. Part of the problem is, is that different agencies, because of the lack of coordination, different agencies are using different data, using different maps. And when you have that, then you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get duplicate decisions. Uh, you're gonna have places that should be, you know, served and are not served. So there needs to be much, much, much better coordination uh, among and between the agencies and also state agencies. Let's not. The states are really important here. 31 governors, again, on a bipartisan basis, mentioned closing the digital divide in their state of the state addresses this year. So we can't leave the states out of the calculation. If We need to build a blueprint mm -hmm. for you know, where the funding is going to go so we don't have duplication and we can get everybody served. And do you see, is, is, are there active efforts right now as the FCC is working to improve its mapping, right? Are there active efforts to do what you just described, which is to really come up with a single comprehensive mapping system that both state and federal agencies can look to, to ensure that, you know, as this state is pushing out funding over here, that another federal agency isn't pushing out funding for the exact same area? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, because it's taking the FCC so long uh, to, to build these maps that the states are doing it by themselves. Uh, Georgia actually worked with a real estate, commercial real estate company. I had the pleasure of talking to the CEO who basically just has this incredible data set of where broadband is and isn't. Uh, Maine is building their own broadband maps using crowdsourcing. Pennsylvania is doing it. So I think the states are saying, hey, we can't wait for you, federal government. You know, we're going to move along and build our own maps. I mean, you know, maybe we can take the lessons learned from the different successful models. And I do believe these state maps are gonna be more granular than what the federal government is gonna come up with. And we can really build a, you know, a system or a model uh, for how to be able to determine not only frankly where broadband is and isn't it, but also where people have access to broadband but don't have it because they can't afford it or because they don't have digital literacy. I think that's really important. Again, 
data is critical. Good data is critical to making good policy. So it's not just about deployment, deployment, deployment. It's also affordability and adoption. So I wonder a little bit, do you feel like there are any, as a result of everyone now working from home or a lot of people working from home for the past year, um, and what we see is a shift, right? Where many companies, including large tech companies are saying, I'm not gonna require my employees to come back to the office, right? They're gonna continue to work from home, perhaps on a permanent basis. Does that change, enhance the policy that, that needs to be, the focus here from kind of, you know, making sure we have big pipes to downtown office buildings. So suddenly we need big pipes to your home, your communities, right? Where people are living and working now. Yeah. And let me address the big pipes because that's something, uh, that's something I absolutely would like to see the Biden and FCC do is change the speed benchmark for broadband. Right now it's 25 megabits per second down and three up. That's ridiculous. Uh, we set that uh, at the Wheeler FCC, I believe it was in 2014 and we're seven years later, and we know that that is completely inadequate, particularly the upload speed, right? Everybody always wants to focus on the download speed, but the upload speed is equally important when you're using, you know, very bandwidth heavy uh, applications. So we've got to change that benchmark. We have to change our goals. This is why in, in those places where we spent tens of billions of dollars over the past decade, you have slow networks because our standards were super low. Uh, and we've just got to change that. Yeah. And it's not, people are going to, the way we work, the way we learn, we're not going back to 2019. I think that's critically important. You know, learning is going to be hybrid. Working is going to be hybrid. Everything is going to be hybrid. Already telehealth is, is a mainstay now, you know, as somebody who does, you know, has an orthopedist, half my meetings with him are, you know, by internet now. So everything is going to change. So yes, we need to make sure that the focus is on getting every single household in America robust. And that's really important, robust broadband. Do you, are you willing to say what you consider that to be now? Like, where would you and, like to see that target? And if you don't wanna- <laughs> at, a, at a minimum, so there was an interesting letter that came out from Senators Portman, Bennett, Warner, and King uh, the other day. And uh, I love that it was, you know, uh, it was bipartisan calling for a hundred symmetrical to be the baseline. Okay. So I'll, I'll go with, uh, I'll go with those guys. Okay. That's fair. A bipartisan uh, target there. So that's great. So um, we have just a couple minutes. I'm going to touch on one more issue with you, which is um, universal service contribution. And, and for those that are not in telecom, this is probably an area most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about. But at the heart of the FCC's ability to provide some of this funding that helps to close the digital divide are contributions to the Universal Service Fund. And those contributions are assessed on telecommunications services, which we discussed earlier, does not include broadband, right? And so the money, however, that's collected from the carriers and the consumers that pay for those services are, is then turned around and used to pay for broadband. So there's a disconnect, right? The, the people that are paying for the service, it's not actually the same people that are, are the same services that are being funded with the money. And as a result of this disconnect, as fewer and few pe fewer people have landline telephones in their homes, for example, the rate at which consumers must contribute that do have those services has gone up. And so we now have a contribution factor of 33.4%, the highest ever in history. And that is up from a, a contribution factor of 21.2% just one year ago, right? So a big rise as a result, again, of this disconnect as fewer people are relying on home phone service, but, but are still contributing those that do pay for that service. Do you feel like that, that is a critical issue for the FCC to address during the Biden administration? Oh, gosh, yes. Look, I, look, I know this is the third rail, right? I mean, you know, whether USF contribution reform should be, uh, ref or USF contribution should be reformed keeps coming up every single time there's a new FCC. And because it's so fraught, uh, you know, it never gets addressed. But the situation now is unsustainable. I mean, it's, the contribution factor, I think, has skyrocketed in, in some ridiculously short period of time from like 17% to now double that, right? 33%. 
there is, there are too few companies who are contributing to the pot and bearing all the burden. And this, again, it's just not sustainable. Now I know that there are proposals to have, you know, Congress appropriate money for, you know, some, if not all of the, of the universal service programs. And I think they're interesting. I'm concerned about annual appropriations for something like Lifeline because then you have to go hat in hand every year, but if it becomes an entitlement program, maybe I'm more comfortable. But these are conversations that are gonna take time and I don't think the FCC has the time. So I think they, they need, regardless of whether the USF pot eventually uh, shrinks, mm -hmm. I still think we need to have a conversation about how to more fairly, uh, you know, fairly ensure that you know contributions are across the board. Yeah. Well, um, Gigi, it is uh, we are at the appointed hour of one o'clock, and so we're going to wrap up there. But I want to thank you so much for making the time to join us for this. Certainly, for us at Womble Pride, this being our first sort of public-facing event since we launched our organization, we have 120 members, both friends and allies across our, our firm. And then I know Lavender Link has been really working hard to bring uh, interesting, timely content to in-house counsel across the country. And I think it's, it's so wonderful that you made the time to talk with us today and give us these insights um, about what's, what are these hot topics and how do they impact businesses really across the board as we head uh, into 2021. So thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you all for coming. Right. Great, thank you everyone.